In my previous video, I was trying to describe my view of time. Um, someone asked me about my theory of time. I don't really have one, and it's more of a view. It's an opinion on how I see the whole, I guess, phenomenon of time in terms of its existence or its reality or unreality or um, what its properties are, whether or not we just conjure it up out of our own consciousness to make sense of a senseless universe. I'm never satisfied with those kinds of videos. And in fact, it's almost, well, it is with some reluctance that I even post them, but I don't know, I guess I have a sense of fairness to sort of, like a lot of my videos, and, and I guess it's just the way that my persona comes across. I seem to speak with a great deal of conviction and absolute certainty and all this sort of thing about uncertainty. And <clears throat> when I watch my videos after I've uploaded them, they often look extremely arrogant. And I've often said that I'm, I believe myself to be an arrogant person, and that's a flaw. That's not something I'm proud of. Um, because when you're arrogant, you just can't listen to other people when they correct you, even if they're right, because you're arrogant and you think that you're smarter than they are. Even if you like that person and respect them, it's like, well, you just think that you're, you know, it's a smugness, right? Um, and I'm aware of this. Uh, you, you can't just sort of stop being what you are, though. That's the thing. Um, but anyway, the, the point is that You have to be careful, I think, with deconstructing everything. Um, I talk about the extreme existential depression that I went through in my mid-twenties. It was, in many ways, brought about by these kinds of musings. Um, in my early twenties, I started to read Sartre. I started to read Camus. I started to read... Um, a lot of Indian philosophers that plumb the very nature of existence itself. Again, I was introduced to Tantra back then. Uh, the discipline, it's not really a philosophy, the discipline that I now more or less follow. Uh, life affirmation, and you want to love life for what it is, not for what it should be or any myths or anything that you build around it. Um, <clears throat> so, so I'm aware of the dangers of approaching this with too much cockiness, with too much um, self-satisfaction, too much, huh, I'm smarter than you people that are all living back there in Plato's cave. Because uh, again, with the arrogance of youth. That's what I did. I thought, well, everybody is stupid because I can see that none of this is real, but they can't. Um, that's a, at least for me, that was a very dangerous way to think. Uh, it was very bad for my sanity, for one thing. <laughs> uh, it cut me off from everyone else. I deliberately started to avoid human contact and everything because I thought, well, these people are all living in a dream. Um, and that was that. And after a couple of years of this kind of thinking, you're pretty much run out of any reason to get out of bed in the morning. <laughs> um, and one of the main things about it is, um, the phenomenon of derealization. When you believe that everything that you exist in uh, everything that you, uh, everything around you is an illusion. And it's also not even an illusion that anyone is deliberately visiting upon you. It's just we live in chaos. We live in a, an insane universe that doesn't make sense. Um, if you sort of apprehend that deep down, if you don't just apprehend it intellectually, but you apprehend it in every possible way with enormous conviction and with your emotions and your psychology, that has a profound effect on you, especially if you believe it for an extended period of time, especially if you believe it in a formative period in, in, uh, in your life. Um, 
But the very fact of it being disturbing, I'm afraid, isn't a refutation. Um, in a sense, I guess I'm saying stay in the cave if you're not ready for the insights to be found when you come out of the cave or are jerked out of the cave. Because at least I believed back then that I was one of those people who had left the cave. Now, of course, I hadn't because I believed in all kinds of things, but I didn't realize it. But the very fact that a lot of things that most people took as solid reality, I, and I didn't believe in these things as solid reality, had its effect on me. It had, I guess, it caused existential panic. I was in more or less a constant state of existential crisis for a number of years and punctuated by periods of existential panic. Um, cause I, you know, I would just walk around nonstop thinking about everything, about life, the universe and everything about deep, deep, deep existential things. Uh, even if my conclusions now I believe are inf were infantile at the time or silly or, um, overdone with, again, the, the cockiness of a young man, a young man who's, a, you know, honestly aware that they're predisposed to cockiness and wishes he wasn't, to be honest. Um, you know, even that, you sort of, well, okay, at least I've thought about this, whereas most people haven't. Uh, at least I've considered this possibility and I haven't run screaming from it. I've kind of tried to stare into the fire hose. And I may have in some ways. And in a sense, I guess that sets me apart from most other people, or at least my willingness to discuss these things openly. Now, imagine a situation in which you don't believe that the physical universe is all that real. You understand that it has the ability to damage you, but you, you sort of say, I don't really understand it at all, really. It's just something that's out there that I have to cope with. And I must hasten to point out that just because you believe something is not real, it doesn't mean that it it's not there at all. It just means it might not be real in the way that we understand reality. I came across an interesting quote from Niels Bohr. Science is not my forte, as everyone knows. Um, but <laughs> for Niels Bohr, it was. Um, here's an interesting quote from him. I think it's two quotes spliced together. Everything we call real is made of things that cannot be regarded as real. If quantum mechanics hasn't profoundly shocked you, you haven't understood it yet. Now that kind of grabbed me when I first came across it. And, it, and as I say, I tend to sort of get these aphorisms in my head and I ruminate them over, you know, over them for days on end sometimes. I never stop thinking. As I say, that's just the way my mind is. Um, and I found that wonderful. I found it wonderful. It's like he stared the void, or not even the void, but he stared the chaos, the fire hose, straight in the face. And he says, yeah, it's crazy. And it is profoundly shocking. But here he is, the picture of stayed sanity. And sort of go, okay, well, if he can do it, I can do it. Or at least other people can do it. I may be one of those other people. Um... I accept the horror of looking into things, and it's a horror that may reside in me and not in the re underlying reality. It might not be that re reality is horrifying. It might be that my take on reality has become horrifying based upon my addiction to, or my dependence upon, forms, constructs, and out-and-out -out belief where empiricism, or just taking things at face value, has become a species of belief. Like when you think that hard science is as hard as it gets, and then you hear what Niels Bohr has to say about quantum physics. <laughs> you don't even have to understand science all that much to sort of get blown away by this. Um, and as I say, I don't want to push anybody in that direction. I have no desire to see anyone's mind get blown out by too much existential musing. Um, and, but what happens is when you, when you adopt that mindset, a certain arrogance creeps in, a certain sort of sense of separateness from other people creeps in, whether you want it to be there or not. 
And you start to think that you're smarter than everybody else, and this is kind of a dangerous way to think. Um, at least in terms of how you believe you are. Like, I might think that I'm smarter than other people, but that doesn't, that has no bearing on whether or not I can face reality. I might say that everybody else is living in a dream, and maybe I'm not, but that doesn't mean that I'm prepared to deal with the fact that I'm living in a dream type thing. Um, just because everybody else is living in an illusion doesn't mean that I am prepared to not live in an illusion. I'm just a puppet who has come to life only to discover it's still on strings, as Stephen King said in his short story, Sometimes They Come Back. <laughs> um, in many ways, yeah, I understand that we are encased or trapped by phenomenal reality. It's necessity. We can't just say that it's not there but we don't know what it is, or maybe I think that we don't know what it is, really. We don't really have the anchors that we think that we have. It's just sort of in-group thinking on a massive scale. Um, now, that needn't really be that terrible if you're ready for it. Um, and see, see how arrogant that sounds. But it, there's an extreme hesitancy to sort of take that leap into actually, in every sense, apprehending the depth of what Mr. Bohr is saying. Um, it, you know, again, that what he's saying is something that I've often suspected, and um, and and again, I'm not saying that just because Niels Bohr said it, said it, it's true. It's just that, you know, your own, my own rational musings seem to lead to the same thing. It, lead to, it seem to lead to the same conclusion. You just keep questioning your first premises, uh, your first principles, and this inevitably happens. Um, you start to think that you've negated the universe, negated existence, negated yourself, when in fact you haven't. All that you've really done is you've established that your ability to apprehend the universe or yourself or the existence or whatever might not be as obviously reliable as you once thought it was. Not being able to grasp what the universe is doesn't mean that the universe doesn't exist. <clears throat> that in itself is a weird species of arrogance. Um, or at least blind belief. Um, so again, all the terrifying metaphors, uh, this open mouth, ah, with existence vomiting out of its mouth, terrifying us with it. Um, I believe at least that compared to most people, um, this is just my honest understanding. I have actually attempted to turn around and stop looking out the rear window of the moving car and look through the windshield. I have attempted to leave Plato's cave. I have attempted to see the universe the way Zapfi's caveman sees it. I at least accept the fact that that is a possible way of looking at reality and that one has to discipline oneself to face that possibility. Um, like, what's going to happen to me when I die? Is that the moment of truth? You know? Or is it just, this is the moment of dissolution and blackness of everything, and I'm gone. It's just a big void forever. Nothingness. Okay, maybe. Um, but, again, that's just a blind guess. I have no way of knowing what's what awaits me at the moment of death, right? So, maybe it's... At the moment of death, it's existential panic, okay? Again, this thought obsessed me and probably contributed to the fact that I never seriously thought about killing myself because I sort of think maybe that makes it worse. <laughs> um, but, you know, again, you have to entertain this possibility. But how do you deal with the fact that that might be a reality that you simply cannot evade and nobody can evade it, except in the sort of Lovecraftian formula, 
deliberately scramble the contents of your consciousness so that you can't understand things, sort of deliberately create mental and psychological, emotional blind spots in your mind so you can't connect the dots of reality. Well, I don't know, I couldn't, I can't live that way. I can't live telling myself I believe things that I don't believe. Um, but I still have to exist in this world, right? I don't want to off myself. I don't want to go back into the matrix. I don't want to do any of that stuff. Or if I do go back into the matrix, I want to remember that I'm in the matrix. I don't want to forget again that I'm in the matrix when I thought I was in solid reality. So what do you do about that? Well, again, what seemed to happen to me was I seemed to discover, although I wasn't using the same words at the time, perspectivism, anekandavada, whatever you want to call it, relative thinking, not as an end in itself, not as something I believe in, but as a means to something, as a tool as opposed to a doctrine. And that's especially, um, as I say, the Saptavangi, this the sevenfold theory of predication, where you take any proposition and you try and twist it around in your head with the seven formula where you say in some ways that's true, in some ways it's not true, in some ways it's indescribable, in some ways it is and isn't true, and some you know, that way. It's not that you're actually abolishing reality. You're actually just loosening your tight grip on it, or a tight grip that you thought you had but you didn't have. Um... And again, I have to live by the clock. You'll see I'm wearing my work uniform. Um, it's 10 to 7 in the morning, and I'm going off to the airport to work. And I exist in a job where time matters. I have to be at certain places at certain times, etc., etc. Um, I can't just pretend that it's all rubbish, because necessity is out there. Necessity says I have to cope with the fact that the world requires certain things of me, whether I like it or not. Um, so I have to use time. I have to employ it. I have to, on a certain level, assume that it exists, at least in terms of my ability to navigate life. But that doesn't mean that it does exist. But it also means that I'm not out and out negating it and saying that it's complete garbage. It's the difference between saying, well, we don't really know what physics is or what the phenomenal universe is, and I'm going to prove that I don't know what the phenomenal, or rather, I'm going to prove that the phenomenal universe doesn't exist by standing in front of this speeding train. Um, it was a bit of standing in front of the speeding trains that I attempted back when I was in my 20s. Whereas now I'm sort of saying, okay, maybe I don't understand the fundamental nature of that speeding train, but I can't just... And pretend it's not there any more than Niels Bohr when he's saying, uh, you know, he's talking about quantum physics um, or quantum mechanics. If you don't, it doesn't matter if you don't understand it, and it doesn't matter if you are horribly shocked by it when you do understand it. It's necessity, right? You can't just pretend that it's not there. I can talk about black holes and gravitational fields and stuff like this and sort of say, okay, that kind of proves that after a certain point, the laws of physics stop working. But it doesn't mean that the, that the laws of physics are thereby just a pile of BS. No. <laughs> Again, you have to sort of, it's not really a, medi a, a happy median between complete skepticism of absolutely everything and blind belief. It's kind of a combination of both. You can say in some ways it's actually true that E equals MC squared or that, you know, mass exists and time exists and everything. Honest, in some ways, no, it's not necessarily true, depending on your point of view. So this is, I guess, why existential matters like this always come across as so disjointed and crazy. And then when you when you deal with these things, you deal with people who like myself included, who come across as a little bit funny in the head, you know, because these people have been affected by the fact that they've walked around thinking this way all the time. Um, but I've often thought, okay, stepping out of the cave into the broad sunlight doesn't necessarily drive you mad. It can, 
but you can, through self-discipline, get sort of get your feet wet slowly and get used to certain aspects of it slowly before it, you know, completely envelops you with existential horror. Um, that seems to have been borne out by time uh, or over time, which, you know, again, I say doesn't necessarily exist in the way that we say it does. But anyway, I've evolved in a certain way to cope with the fact that I don't necessarily believe in the universe the same way other people do. Uh, it is possible to navigate the world and not go insane. Um, perhaps other people might look at me and think this guy is insane because of what he thinks, but I'm not walking around babbling incoherently to myself or, you know, talking to imaginary rabbits or whatever. Uh, I think that I'm reasonably sane, at least in terms of my ability to navigate life. Um, so it does seem to be possible, at least, to do this to stare the fire hose square in the face, to look right into the maw of that vomiting monster that is reality. Um, but the point of this, is, this video is, how do you actually put all that together in your head? How do you put that together in a form that's coherent enough to discuss it with other people? Uh, that's the rub, right? Um, and... One of the most interesting things about this is the when you're thinking existentially like this is to run up against people that have a profoundly negative view of everything. Again, this draws me to horror writers. And it, the question arises, why is it that some people are able to stare into that black pit? Why is it that some people are able to stare into the void? Um, why is it that, you know, as Nietzsche says, beware of staring into the abyss because it stares back at you. Why is it that some people can actually handle the abyss staring back into them and not be destroyed by it? Like, I was damaged by doing so, but it seemed to actually, I seemed to actually recover. Why is it that some people can do this, while others just don't even want to attempt it? Uh, and what does that say about me versus them? You know, I'm saying that there's me and then there's them, which is the entire human race, right? Um, again, I think it's possible. And I think that there may be rewards in there that people might want to actually pursue. Uh, for one thing, it once you get used to the fact that maybe the universe might not exist at all the way we thought it, we think it does, it can, in a certain sense abolish anxiety as opposed to exacerbating it. I see a lot of people, like like when I look at in Mendham, I look at, I see somebody who just, his mind has been destroyed by staring into that fire hose, by staring into that abyss. It still works, but I know how this is going to sound. Well, whatever, I'll just blurt it out. He strikes me as someone without the psychological and emotional robustness to deal with this sort of thing, but he opened that Pandora's box and it came out and smashed him in the face. Okay, sorry that you did that, but, well, I did the same thing, and I almost ended up like that. Uh, now, I know how that sounds. But, again, it may be true. Just because I'm saying something in a very arrogant way and putting it across as I'm smarter or more robust than him, or that I'm more robust, say, than a guy like Thomas Ligotti, uh, who's got a brilliant mind but doesn't seem to be able to handle the reality that he's sort of illustrating, but I can how come I can read his books and I'm not, you know, chronically anxious recluse like him? I don't know. But I seem to be able to. Um, and, you know, I look at Niels Bohr. Again, you look at that and you say, oh, how? like, saying that everything that we think of as real cannot is made of things that can't be said to be real. Think about that. Think about the implications of that over an extended period of time. And what's that going to do to you? I don't blame anybody for not wanting to do that. Um, and I don't judge people if they've had their minds shattered by doing so. Um, Zappi's caveman, of course. Um, the Vishvarupa, the, the denizen of Plato's cave who's jerked out into the sunlight. But... Again, 
How do you explain the fact that some people can do this and not be destroyed by it? Um, what is the method? And again, the only thing I can come up with is self-discipline. Um, get in control of your mind. Put it where you want it to go. Um, and then take it out of there when it, things get too hot in the oven, right? Um, if you're thinking too much about a certain aspect of your own philosophy or your own point of view, or you're just sort of trying to analyze where your thoughts are going, and you end up in a pit of horror, okay, develop the capacity to take your mind out of there and put it into somewhere where your mind can relax a bit. Like, I don't know, watch TV a while. Whatever. Um go back into the matrix for R&R, &R, I guess. Understand that we may be hooked on being in the matrix, and it might not be a simple matter of leaving and saying, oh, things are so much better. It's like I was underwater for 20 years, and now I can breathe. No, it might you might go into the bends. It might be more like getting born, where <laughs> reality itself can be horrifying at first. But it doesn't make it any less real, and it doesn't make it absolutely lethal. Um, so approach with caution, and I would say approach with self-discipline, um, but I don't think that kicking away all of one's props is a recipe for lunacy uh, or personal disintegration. I'd say that in most cases it is. Um, or it probably is, I guess, but not necessarily in all cases. Um, it does seem to be able to be done. And to me, once you make that realization, there seems to be little else that you really are interested in doing, um, or at least doing as an end in itself, trying to figure out what all this is. Again, I'm not so much interested in escaping this reality as I am at, in understanding it. Um, and I guess being it, living with it, living as this reality, but understanding that this reality might not be real in the way that we all think it is. What rewards can you say? Um, come with this kind of thinking? Well, I think that at this level, if you could talk about whatever rewards or whatever goal you may reach or whatever state you may get to, if you could talk about it, then the effort expended to get here would hardly be worth the effort. Um, you're going off all known maps um, into utter terra incognita where none of your rules work anymore. Um... What are the, why would anyone want to do that? How do you explain that? 